Thanks, Shireen. Um, wanted to make a quick note that uh, Shireen's and the, some of the other slides, we'll, we'll try to make those available uh, after we're finished here today. Also wanted to mention that the since uh, Shireen was talking about um, YouTube, uh, our very first video that we started with this morning, uh, some reported that they didn't have the audio uh, for that, and that is going to uh, it is available right now on on YouTube as well. At this point in the set webinar, we would like to shift our focus a little bit and talk about visual resources and visual thinking. Carl Fleischauer is the former coordinator for the American Memory Program, a pilot project that modeled the dissemination of historical collections in electronic form. He continues to serve the collection digitizing effort at the Library of Congress in the National Digital Library Program. The title of this presentation today is Using the Archive, Making the Archive. side of it. The first collection we actually managed to get up on the web was uh, some of our Civil War photos, about 1,100 of them out of the 7,000 we have. You search on a term like vessels because the metadata is pretty good for this set and uh, you get a group of pictures that includes this uh, nice shot of the turret of the USS Monitor the ironclad that has just been rescued from deep water and is being conserved at the Mariner's Museum down in uh, Newport News. Some of the collections uh, we think of as photographic, but the truth is they mix things uh, in other media. The uh, collection of historic American building survey and historic American engineering record materials, which comes to us from the National Park Service is a good example of that. Uh, the documentation done in the field conjoins photos and uh, measure drawings and uh, often typed data pages. This is a nice example of uh, a photograph that documents part of a historic house in New Jersey. But in some ways, even more fun is the uh, look that you can get because of the delineations that were made either of architectural plan views and elevations, or in this case, uh, some of the construction details or uh, parts, as it were. The Prints and Photos online catalog is a, uh, uses a new interface that in many ways is uh, nicer and more facile than the American memory one. And uh, we'll just take an example here where we go to the very famous uh, Farm Security Administration photos and type in G's Bend. In the new interface, you get uh, what they call a grid view, which is a little teeny thumbnails. There's also a gallery view in which the thumbnails are a little bigger. And uh, presently, you get to a picture like this one. This is an Arthur Rothstein photograph from uh, 1937. and. Uh, it shows one of the folks who lived in that community down in Alabama. When you go to the uh, metadata for this, and here's a way to use the photos that is not so well known, and over on the left-hand side, there's a, uh, a link, Browse Neighboring Items. And uh, the fun of this is that actually what you do is you dive into a numerical series. What these are is uh, images arranged by file number. So in effect, you're looking at the negative file as the negatives were filed. And these photographers worked like photojournalists. They'd go out on a shoot. We heard uh, Pete Souza talk a little bit about the shoots he does today. And you make hundreds or thousands of pictures, in his case, in a day. and. Uh, this gives you a bit of an insight into how the FSA photographers work, just because these things tend to clump in, uh, in shooting groups. 
And in fact, it's reinforced nicely in uh, corollary materials. Uh, we like to encourage people to look around and uh, not just at the pictures. And in this case, there's a collection of uh, uh, letters in the University of Louisville Stryker papers collection where you see the instruction there that uh, Stryker sent to Rothstein in 1937 telling him to get some families that are farm tenants, uh, make a series of pictures, show the houses, show the people, show the farm, the buildings, the fences, et cetera. And uh, as we saw, that is indeed what, uh, what Rothstein did. The uh, thing beyond our own presentation on the website that has been fairly interesting for us over the last couple of years is putting some pictures out on Flickr. We reach a rather different audience there in, in a different way, even though it's the same pictures. And in this case, we had a group that was put up as mystery pictures. And in fact, as you might expect, we got quite a bit of advice about what they showed. And in this case, you can see at the right-hand corner that uh, someone went around and took a picture of the harbor in Marseille today from about the same vantage point. And so uh, it helped our catalogers catch up and uh, do a good job of properly cataloging that picture. Um, we do archiving of these digital things, and uh, although storage management's not my, my specialty, I'll, I'll throw away one slide on it. But one of the things you get into in archiving is a, a deep concern and fascination with identifiers, the little hidden numbers that glue everything together. So here we're back at this G's Men photo, and down at the bottom, we have a identifier that is actually for bookmarking, as it says, but it's for bookmarking the bibliographic record. In other words, it takes you back to that catalog card, not necessarily to the picture in the most direct way. Over here on the left-hand side, there's another identifier, and this one's sort of more interesting from a picture archiving point of view. It's an identifier called a handle. That's why it starts HDL. And it has, at the end, the FSA.8B35937, which is what the computer access programs use to, uh, to shape the interface for us. And when you actually bring up one of the JPEG images, you can see there's a logical path name there. And that logical path name uh, parses in sort of an obvious way if you start looking at it. Uh, we've got directories that are called service. That's where we put the access version of the pictures, but not the masters. Then there's another slash, and you get the directories owned by the prints and photos division, then the name of the collection, and then the numerical images are put away in these sort of stack directories by group and subgroup. So if you actually look at a display of the directory, You'll see that, say, for that picture uh, at the top, 35901, there are six different versions of it. Those are images that are different sizes, and they play out in the interface, some in the grid, some in the gallery, some for the zoom in. And uh, that numerical system is the, is the secret sauce that, uh, that gets those things to work. As I said, I'm not particularly a storage architecture person, but it's certainly the case that if you're going to archive digital content in any extent, you need a fairly robust architecture. It's a, a non-trivial exercise. You need a computer center and some computer people. I had to borrow this picture because I couldn't find one for our own place. This is from the National Library of Australia. But the core elements for storage are familiar in most of these things. Uh, there's a disk array, which is at the center and the bottom, and a data tape library over to the right, and then some controlling servers and networks in between. And you really have to start to build something like that in order to do a good job with big collections. We have thought, I think, a lot here about the importance of formatting materials uh, before we archive them. When we're in the driver's seat and we're scanning our own historical photographs, we sort of have uh, 
tried to find formats that are preservable. A format in this case usually means both an encoding for the uh, picture information as well as a file wrapper. We'd like to get all the image information off of the original item and uh, I'll point you to an interesting study we just had uh, put together with some folks looking at uh, image information on negatives and how you might go about figuring out what all image information means and how to get it. Traditionally, we've been making TIFF wrapper files that have uncompressed bitmaps. That's the encoding inside of the TIFF. But I can say a lot of people here are looking pretty hard at JPEG 2000 lossless compression and our video people where they're making master copies of old videotapes are already using an approach that employs lossless JPEG 2000 for the frame images. For born digital, and now we're in Pete Souza's arena where people are out doing some new shooting, we don't have so much experience with archiving that here. Uh, it sounds like Pete said a lot more. But we certainly share an interest in keeping picture data sort of in a raw or malleable state. It's really helpful uh, if you're going to reuse things, not to bake in too many editing decisions but you want to uh, try to standardize on a certain level, and most of those raw formats that come out of the camera are uh, proprietary. And uh, so I can say, well, we're attracted to the Adobe DNG or digital negative uh, format, but if there are some shooters in this webinar, I'd kind of be curious to hear what you guys think. Pete Souza did a nice touch there talking about embedded metadata and the importance of embedded metadata. We see it in digitized historical images. Identifiers are one of the things you really want to embed. They're important and it gets us back to identifier and identifier systems. And I should say metadata sometimes people think of as what you use for search or discovery and that's certainly important. But the metadata we're focused on here as well includes technical information that you need to manage or preserve your pictures. Of course you need metadata in databases of one sort or another or catalogs that you manage, but embedding has a lot to recommend it for safety and redundancy to park something in the file. We do a little today, but we'd like to do more. It's interesting, and here again we get back to Pete Souza's talk. Professional photographers at work today, I think, are really concerned and focused with this. It's a very active area. Partly it's motivated by the fear of theft and the desire to get uh, copyright information in the pictures, or in the case of White House photos, not copyright information. But it also, uh, embedding metadata also supports self-archiving and uh, professional photographers really do need to manage archives of their own. And some picture agencies and picture customers require it. So if you don't know about it, I'll call attention for people who are shooters to uh, the photometadata.org website. Uh, we at the library helped uh, provide a little funding to this when it was put together. Uh, David Ricks is the main guy behind it, and uh, he uses this example of a photo, and then you hover the mouse over it. It's from Corbis, and you get the metadata, and I think you can see at once how useful it is to have that kind of information buried right in the photo. Another website worth mentioning for folks who are shooting today, if you don't know about it, is DP Best Blow. This comes from the American Society of Media Photographers. Here again, we provided some support as they were putting this together. They also have some discussion of metadata in terms of where it fits in the workflow. And as you can see by this slide, uh, telling you to watch out when there uh, are some risks associated with the older software versions. But the DP Best Flow overall uh, does a nice job of uh, of sketching in the workflow and ideas about workflow for good management and good work for, uh, for new professional photography. So that's kind of what I had prepared. And uh, let me stop here and uh, see if there are other questions uh, 
Otherwise, keeping it short is a great virtue at this moment, I think. Uh, Carl, we've got a quick question for you. Um, are you suggesti suggesting that the DMG, because of standard rather than factory raw files by manufacturers? Well, I would say that uh, our study of it suggests that uh, it sort of does what Adobe says it does, which is it gives you a wrapper that does not particularly disturb the raw data. That is, it keeps it in its malleable form, but it adds quite a bit of metadata that allows the pictures to be interpreted uh, more easily by a variety of software applications. So it looked like it was uh, something that, again, left you with the raw data in pretty good shape, but added this layer of uh, uh, added metadata information that would be useful for the long haul. Is, is that your impression? Yeah, that's my impression. Um, let, let me let me ask a, a different question with a little different angle. Uh, do you have a pixel density recommendation for scan TIFF images that you use personally? Well, the uh, the interesting thing in that study that I cited was that for say 35 millimeter negatives. Uh, we had been going on the long side to 4,000 or 5,000 pixels and looking at a rescan we're doing of the Farm Security Administration 35 millimeter, which is uh, uh, photographs that were made in the 1930s. I think the analysis that was made by looking at spatial frequency response suggested that something more like 2,800 to 3,000 pixels on the long side, you know, would be sufficient for those. Uh, sometimes you might bump it up a little bit to say make it around 3,000 or 3,500 or something. But uh, it's been interesting to to see that we scan a lot of negatives, and so the concern here has been more on the negative side. I would say. I'm trying to remember what's done with reflected light materials these days. You know, I I don't think it's very often the case that people here go up as high as 600 dots per inch against an original item. But I'm not confident that I know what the number has been lately. I will say, though, that increasing bit depth has been uh, um, also a focus. And so when we scan... Uh, transparencies and negatives now, we tend to go to 16 bits per channel rather than 8 bits per channel. Great. I appreciate that advice. Uh, Carl, thanks again for your presentation.